All right, good. Okay, so uh, welcome. Uh, this session uh, is on the, uh, the schedule. It says Introduction to Web Components in Polymer, so just pretend that's what it says there. Um, I did a workshop on this yesterday with the name Hacking Web Components, so that's the, that's the title on there. My name is Keto Man. I'll, just tell me, tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am uh, the principal consultant at Virtua, which is a company that does uh, training, consulting, architecture, mentoring, etc., around prime faces, JSF, Java EE, web components, and LifeRay. Okay, uh, and I'll get into uh, in a minute a, li a little more about uh, the, why I'm talking about web components. Um, I'm official. I'm, in, I'm an official Prime Faces uh, U.S. partner, uh, which is actually Virtua is a Prime Faces U.S. partner. How many people here have heard of Prime Faces? I'm just curious. Okay, so a couple of you. Okay. I wrote a book like a long time ago, like over a decade ago, called JSF in Action, uh, and I run a website called JSF Central. I uh, run an enterprise Java newscast, so if you do do Java backend stuff, uh, the enterprise Java newscast is a handy place. Um, every couple months, it's me and a couple other guys uh, talk about server-side Java stuff, um, and also some front-end stuff as well. And I speak at lots of conferences as well. So uh, you might wonder why me, a Java guy, is talking about web components uh, in Polymer. Uh, <laughs> And the main reason is for the last, um, you know, over a decade, I've been working with teams uh, and doing training mostly around uh, UI component-based development with Java server faces. Um, and uh, JSF is a, it's a server-side Java framework, um, which was came out a long time ago before browsers were really that powerful, right? So basically, what it provides are UI components, um, and uh, you basically can declarative, declaratively define UI components. Um, that render as HTML, CSS, JavaScript, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I, for years, I've been bitten with the uh, com component development bug, right? Uh, so the minute I saw web components, I thought, geez, this is great. You know, now we can have an actual component model for the web actually in the browser as opposed to trying to make uh, approximations on the server. And what appeals to me is that they're cross-platform, um, cross-framework, right? So regardless of which... Uh, JavaScript framework you're using, or even server-side frameworks, you can use web components. Okay, so that, that's really the draw for me uh, as a, as a primarily a Java guy. Also, um, I've often been the guy on the Java team that actually writes JavaScript and knows what CSS does. Uh, so, so, uh, so it's a pretty good fit for me. Um, so, uh, just uh, as a little bit of background. Um, if you think about it, uh, if you look at any modern web application today, um, this is Dropbox, which I, I always really like their UI. Um, think of any modern web application today. You basically see a lot of web components or U UI components on the page, right? Um, and those of you who have worked with more component-oriented frameworks like React are pretty familiar with this concept, right? Um, but the idea here uh, is if you look at this page, you can see different UI components. In the middle, there's a, sort of a data grid component, you know, data list, data grid component. In the upper left-hand corner, there's link components or maybe some sort of menuing component that iterates through a set of links, right? Uh, on the upper right-hand corner, there's a drop-down menu. Uh, and there's a breadcrumb component in the middle, there's a toolbar component, there is a search component, etc. Okay. So when we build UIs, uh, even if it, that's not actually how you're defining it um, in terms of the markup, visually it's a, it's a component, right? And you can componentize your, your user interface into little bits that you can work with. And if you think about it, component models have been around for a long time. Okay. How many people have ever written any Visual Basic? Anybody? Ah, so there's some, there's some, uh, some people my age here, which is good. Uh, and uh, around that same time, Delphi came out. Uh, how many people have you ever used Delphi before? Uh, so one person, woo, two, all right. Uh, so, so Delphi was another sort of de development tool for Windows, um, and it had a really great component model. Um, and that's actually how I fell in love with uh, components, really, was working with Delphi. Um, there were other tools, Power Builder, a lot of stuff in the, the .NET world, uh, some stuff in the Java world as well. And this is all sort of, you know, more back-end or desktop development. Uh, on the web, there's all sorts of different component suites. How many people remember YUI? 
How many people still use YUI? Anybody? I'm just curious. All right. Um, Kindle UI, Bootstrap, jQuery UI, Weijmo, Prime UI, uh, Infogistics uh, components, uh, Telerik, other Telerik component suites. Uh, there's lots of stuff out there um, in the the the, uh, the uh, browser world, right? Um, and if you think about it, the reason we build components is because we like reusable UI functionality. Uh, and um, the benefit is that if you build a UI component, you build that functionality once, right? Whether it's a breadcrumb, you know, breadcrumb works a certain way. Data grids are always a great example, right? You know, tabs, etc. they work a certain way. You encapsulate that functionality and then you can use it in the same application on different screens. Um, you can use it across different applications, um, which becomes important if you're working on a, a team inside of a company that's building multiple applications on the same framework. Um, and they really allow you to, to basically uh, speed up development because you can concentrate on application functionality, right? You don't have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how breadcrumb works. You actually just throw a breadcrumb component on the page and wire it up to the rest of your application. So that's the main reason that we use web, uh, we use components. So going back to that, that page on Dropbox, if you were to just do an inspection on the page, you basically see that um, there's no UI components in terms of what the browser understands, right? So even, you know, however Dropbox is constructed, maybe they're using a framework that has some sort of component architecture, maybe they're not, but the browser just sees a whole bunch of divs, spans, anchors, you know, primitives, essentially, right? Um, with, you know, maybe some special attributes that the framework uses, data sort, you know, see here, um, data ascending, etc., right? But the browser doesn't know about those things, it doesn't care, right? So the web platform um, doesn't really support any sort of native component model, right? At least not until recently. All the browser understands is, are, are the, the primitive elements that are built into HTML, okay? And we generally like to work with abstractions, right? So, you know, if everything you had to do was involved building on primitives, it gets, it gets to become pretty tedious. So, um, what we'd like to do is work with something that gives you some sort of higher level of abstraction. So here's an example of a, of a prime faces data table. It's server side, but the concepts work client or server, right? Uh, so here we have a data table component. We have some attributes that it supports. Um, you know, it has columns. You can put stuff inside the columns, and it can iterate through data and display the data, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, but what you're looking at is not the markup. You're looking at a component that has a particular interface and particular features. Right? Um, with uh, front end frameworks, it works a little bit differently. Usually, you define a div, some specific elements that it supports. You throw in some uh, specific classes, maybe some data, data attributes, some other attributes that it supports, right? And then magically, it turns that into a widget, right? I'm um, just saying, here's the same thing with jQuery UI. So you throw in some divs um, and some specific IDs and stuff, and, and it sort of magically turns it into a widget. But at the end of the day, you're not really working so directly with the, the actual DOM, right? Or at least you're hoping not to. So a web component is essentially the idea that you can take this, this, this concept of a, of a component that abstracts away the markup and the functionality and package it in a way that's reusable and works on the actual web platform as opposed to with your specific framework, okay? And they basically bring a native component model to HTML. It's actually part of HTML5, okay? One of the 4,000 specs which are under the HTML5 umbrella, okay? So um, here's, here's a, a, a good example. Uh, we've all written uh, apps that have uh, modal dialogues. However you feel about modal dialogues, the users like, like them, right? So there's always gotta be a modal dialogue somewhere. So let's say you wanted to just have a very simple dialogue. You know, you could course write a div and do some CSS and, and JavaScript and pretty quickly have one. But you could also just use a component. So this is um, a, a Polymer uh, element that is actually using web components. And you see here, um, we just say paper action dialogue. That's the name of the element. And we give it some attributes that are part of its public API. And we put some content in the middle, and then we put a confirmation button in there, which is another uh, 
polymer uh, paper element as well. Okay. And this is actually markup that is used on the client in the browser. The browser actually is doing something with this um, and you executing JavaScript to represent actual tags that the browser understands. Okay. This is actually part of the DOM as opposed to being something parsed by your framework. Okay. So like many things in web development, uh, web components is not just one thing. It's many different things. Um, and it's actually a collection of a few different key standards. One of them is custom elements. And this is arguably, actually it's not arguably, it is the most important part of web components. Um, custom elements allow you as a developer to extend the language of HTML. You can write elements, um, and you can actually create new tags which are your own vocabulary. Okay, and have their own functionality. This is really cool because this is the first time we've actually been able to extend the tags that are used in the page on the web platform itself as opposed to putting markup in there and then using some uh, either server-side or client-side uh, framework to actually work with it via tags. Okay. Another one is HTML templates. Um, so there's, you know, Templating is a very important part of web development, whether it's client-side templating or server-side templating. Um, and there's a standard that actually allows you to have templates in your HTML pages that are understood by the browser. Okay. So it's a very important feature. Another feature is HTML imports, which allows you to import a file that has additional dependencies, whether they're um, scripts or CSS or JavaScript, etc. Okay, all packaged into one file. It can also, also have markup, templates, etc. Okay. Then there's also Shadow DOM. Um, and Shadow DOM, which I think is a great name, some people think it's a little om ominous, but I think it's kind of cool. Um, Shadow DOM allows you to provide encapsulation for the child, el child elements within your custom element. So let's say you've got a data table component, right? Data table is going to have dozens of spans, divs, all sorts of stuff in there, right? Um, but when you use CSS, you don't really want your CSS to bleed into the world of that component, right? How many people have tried to use a component library and find that you have a CSS conflicts with whatever uh, uh, CSS is in your app? Anyone had that problem before? Okay. Uh, so Shadow DOM is, is basically designed to, to, to get around that problem. The idea is that you can actually have your components be encapsulated from the rest of the page. Okay. Um, on top of that, there's something called CSS Custom Properties, uh, which is being proposed as a way to uh, sort of expose specific styles from a shadow DOM. Um, so that, you know, if you write a, a, a data table component, let's say the developer can't necessarily style things directly in your component, but you can say, all right, well, let me expose a property for the uh, top panel of my component so that the developer can customize that. So that's what CSS custom properties does. Um, also, it's, it's nice in general because you can find variables that you can use in CSS. Uh, it's basically similar to what you can do with less. Okay. So here's an example of a custom element. It's, it's, it's very uh, straightforward. Basically, it's a counter. When you um, when you put this on your page, what happens is it creates a little counter that just counts up from the start value. Okay, so very simple. I'll show you some code a little bit later. And this is how you might define a uh, custom element. Uh, basically, uh, there's a couple things to note here. First, um, you can create a, uh, a new uh, custom element based on a, an existing prototype. Okay, so in this example at the top here, uh, I'm creating a, a, a new uh, element from the HTML element, which is sort of the base element from, for HTML, okay? Um, but you can also uh, subclass existing custom elements. So let's say I had, you know, one that I wanted to subclass. I could do it here in the second example, which is creating a, uh, uh, a special counter, a deluxe counter based on my simple counter, okay? Um, and then you would add properties and methods and things like that to your class, just like any other, any other JavaScript uh, class. Um, and then once you've done that, you can actually register it on the page and say, okay, well, this is the tag that I want to be used, and this is the prototype I want to use it. Okay. And um, you'll see some more examples later, but this is the, the general idea is that you can just basically create a prototype and assign a tag to it. So kind of, kind of a powerful feature. Okay. 
So uh, where can you use this feature, this custom elements feature? Well, uh, as you can see, Chrome has excellent support for uh, custom elements. And this is largely because Google is the driving force behind web components. Um, they've been pushing it for years. And I think this year is really the year where the other browser vendors are finally on board. Okay. So basically, um, the, you can see Chrome has great support. Opera seems to be pretty much in lockstep with Chrome. Um, has anyone actually used Opera for anything? I'm curious. I mean, it, it seems to always be around, so someone must be, you know, funding it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm always wondering, like, who those people are, you know. But anyways, Opera supports it. Um, and uh, Firefox, that little green flag there, is saying that it has experimental support that you can turn on with a flag. So, so Mozilla is supporting all this stuff, but it's all sort of something you have to turn on as opposed to being there automatically by default, like it is in Chrome. Okay. Um, and I'll get to in a second more about where things are going with who's supporting what. Um, the next one I want to talk about is HTML templates. So uh, an HTML template is essentially just HTML that you can define, but it's actually inert. Um, it, it does get parsed by the browser, but it doesn't get uh, activated. Okay. Then here I could have a script tag or a template tag or something else. Um, so basically, you define the template, and then you can programmatically attach it to the DOM whenever you need it. Right. So this first example at the top, you see I'm grabbing, I'm calling the import node uh, to grab a copy of my uh, template, I'm, and that lets me sort of clone it. Okay. And then I'm um, adding it to the body. Okay. And in the second example, I'm doing the same thing, um, but I'm adding another copy of the same template. Okay. So basically, I'm I have defined this section once, and I've repeated it twice. Okay. So this allows you to do things like you know have different parts of your application, and you know, and throw them on a page and reuse them. Uh, and then you can use this even outside of uh, web components. So all these specs you can use independently if you want to. Okay. So that example would have this output inside the template baby twice because we appended that template to the DOM twice. Okay. So HTML template has really good support. It's a pretty much a no-brainer in terms of implementing it. You know, pretty handy thing, and it's actually supported in. Uh, Pretty much most of the modern browsers, modern browsers being everything except for IE, right? Uh, so, uh, as you can see, even Edge has added support for it. Okay, and they just did that very recently as well. Okay. How many people are playing with Microsoft Edge? Anybody? Only a few of you. Okay. Well, it only runs on Windows 10, which is kind of a problem. <laughs> but, but I've heard it's a much better browser. So another feature is HTML imports. Um, how many people have used this in their code? Code, code to look something like this? Anybody? So a few of you. You know, you need to include Bootstrap. You include like five different things. You need to include some other library. You use like five different things, and all of a sudden you've got all these different links and scripts that you have to load in your page, right? Um, you can simplify this by using HTML imports. So you could abstract all that stuff, put it inside one file, and then import that one file. Okay. And so, so inside of that HTML import, you would have all of this stuff here, right? But you basically are just importing it as one link, okay? So this is pretty powerful because it allows you to sort of encapsulate resources, right? And functionality in a single file. Even though it's called HTML, it doesn't actually automatically get rendered or anything. I kind of think a better extension might make more, make more sense, like, you know, module or package or something. Uh, but essentially, it's 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 you know it's parsed, but uh, it's not um, you know it's not going to be part of rendered automatically. Usually, you put templates in there. You might put you know script uh, references, uh, CSS references, etc. Okay. Um, but this way, what you can do is you can package up a module of your system. You could package up an individual web component. Um, you could package up just the imports and links for a particular library you're trying to use. All sorts of stuff like that. Okay. So HTML imports um, are sort of in that same boat. Chrome does it; not everybody else does. Okay. 
Um, there's a particular caveat, though, with HTML imports, and that is that Mozilla has recently said that they're not really going to work on it anymore um, because they want to see how things work with uh, ES2015 modules. Okay. So um, basically, they're saying we don't want to have two ways to handle dependencies in our application, um, so let's wait and see sort of what happens. Google, on the other hand, is saying, nope, we like HTML imports, so let's try and come up with a way to make everyone else happy with it. Maybe we can um, have the same underlying loader system that modules use, et cetera. Um, so this is one that's still up in the air. Uh, and I, I think what the key thing, the key difference, though, is that web, web component specs usually are declarative, right? ES 2015 modules are imperative. You've got to write code, right? So, you know, as long as we have some way to put, you know, to, to actually work with ES2015 modules in a declarative manner, so we can import a single web component, then I think everybody will be happy. Okay. So another feature is that the other one, the, the ominous one, called Shadow DOM. Shadow DOM is probably best shown with, with a, a demo, so let me do that. All right, so here's my uh, deluxe counter. Very exciting, right? Um, so deluxe counter, you know, you can start and stop it. Just a counter, not too interesting. But it is actually a web component. So if I, excuse me, if I look at this, you can see in the DOM here, it actually, there's an element called deluxe counter, right? Um, and inside of it, there is this thing called a shadow root, right? It doesn't say, you know, div or whatever, right? It just says shadow root. And if I want to, I can still inspect a shadow root. I can see that it has a style in there, um, and then it also has a uh, div tag in there as well. And basically what's happening is this uh, is being, uh, the counter is incrementing, right? And then, you know, you can see that if I change it, uh, you know, the class changes as well, okay. But the important thing is that the shadow root thing is showing up here. So, if I do this, uh, let me move this up a bit. All right, so let's say I see, do, do var, uh, oh. So I get a handle to my element. Whoops. Oh, yeah. That's not going to work. Okay. So, I look at counter. Okay. You see it's that same element, right? I've got the shadow root down here. Okay. But if I do this, what do I get? I don't get anything in there. I get the, the comment, right? Okay, sorry. Let me uh, see the best way to do that. Here, we'll, we'll just do old school. No, that's not going to do it. All right. Go at the bottom, but yeah, I see it's cut off a little bit. Um, oh. Why don't we do this? Okay. Okay. So can you see it now? Okay. So you see, if I call child nodes, um, I'm not seeing that shadow root. I'm just seeing there, uh, there was a comment in there that I'm seeing, right? But if I do this, I actually see the actual child elements. Okay. And actually what I can do is this as well. Okay. Which gives me that shadow root. Okay. So I have a little bit of encapsulation there, right? Um, and so basically you see it's not showing up in queries, right? 
And if I were to, to uh, style this div, uh, you know, to say I want to make all divs with the background of red or something, it would not pierce the shadow root, right? So in this example, the, it would not affect this inner div uh, here, okay? So we have that encapsulation, right? It doesn't show up on queries unless you explicitly query it, right? And it doesn't show up in CSS queries as well either, okay? So that, that's really, really what shadow root, uh, the shadow DOM is all about. It's really having that level of encapsulation. Leave it like this. All right, so Shadow DOM, again, is in that, that wonderful world of Chrome supports it and uh, Firefox does, sort of. Um, it's one of those st st standards that everyone's sort of, sort of on board with. They're still working out some kinks. It's also the most complicated ones for the browser uh, developers to implement, as you might imagine. Um, there's all sorts of issues. Um, in terms of uh, things like content retargeting or content projection, where uh, you can, uh, if you put uh, elements inside of the, your custom element, um, then that's part of the Shadow DOM. Let's say you, you know, your custom element is using Shadow DOM. Um, then it has to sort of project those nodes and it reinsert them in the right place, you know, from the original page to your custom element. So all, so all sorts of intricacies like that. You can have nested Shadow DOMs. Um, Etc. So, so it's a, it's a pretty pretty uh, uh, complicated feature to implement, but it's very powerful. And the idea of having a CSS encapsulation is a wonderful wonderful idea. Okay. Um, one of the things that's happening um, uh, currently is uh, there's some discussion about exactly how to handle the CSS part of it. Initially, it was possible. Uh, to essentially, uh, you know, write, use a special um, pseudo element uh, called shadow to reference things inside the shadow root via CSS, okay? You could also use another uh, combinator called deep, which would let you sort of go through all the shadow roots on the page. So you have the, you have the encapsulation, but you could pierce it if you wanted to very easily. Um, and uh, how many people have you seen a lot of people using important in CSS before? Good practice, bad practice, annoying practice, right? Uh, so the, the initial uh, CSS features that allowed you to pierce the shadow DOM sort of had that same problem, right? They're like, well, if I'm having trouble styling these elements, let me just rip through the shadow DOM. Who cares about it, right? Uh, so in practice, it didn't turn out to work out very well. Uh, so uh, CSS custom properties are one solution, um, and I think a lot of that stuff is being handled in the CSS scoping uh, spec. So that still needs to work at, be worked out in terms of what is the going to be the final solution for that. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, is, is theming really ironed out yet? And the, and the answer is not really. I mean, Polymer has a solution for it based on custom properties, um, but in terms of the default specs, not really worked out. So basically, the bottom line is Chrome, Android, and Opera support everything, right? Firefox supports everything except for HTML imports, but the, you have to use that experimental flag. And you can even you can use HTML imports via the experimental flag as well, but they're not going to be working on it anymore. Safari supports only HTML templates. IE doesn't support anything. Uh, and that's really because they're not really doing a lot of new stuff with IE anyways, right? All everything's going to Edge, and Edge has HTML templates in preview, okay? Um, so, so basically, though, there, there is agreement on sort of the two key things, custom elements and uh, HTML templates. So all the browser vendors are pretty much on board with those, okay? Um, the other things, Shadow DOM, they're still working on, working on, working out the kinks. Um, and then the, the only big sort of question mark is HTML imports. And if you think about it, uh, you know, Shadow DOM is very cool. Um, HTML, HTML imports are very nice, but all you really need is custom elements and HTML templates. Those are the key things. Okay. Yes? Uh, 
Um, so the question is, are there any um, issues with having inline CSS inside of Shadowdom, basically? Um, and, and, the, and the answer is, I, don't, I haven't seen any issues with that. I know that if you look at, you know, pretty much any of the custom elements that I've seen people develop, um, they will put CSS inside of the template element, which would be inside the attached Shadow DOM. So. All right. So of course, um, you know, we're all familiar with polyfills, right? Uh, so there are polyfills to support these features in browsers, okay? And uh, polyfill is really just a whole bunch of uh, JavaScript that can emulate an existing or a, a spe specified feature. And uh, one of the things I will say is that I think polyfills are a good example of polyfills, shims, et cetera, are a very good example of the power of the web platform and the uh, benefit of having a dynamic language like JavaScript built into it, right? The fact that you can do things like uh, a Shadow DOM polyfill, um, there are some issues with it, but basically in the Shadow DOM polyfill, they're wrapping all of the elements inside of the page to provide additional functionality, um, which is why it's a little bit of a slow polyfill. Um, but uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, you can do, uh, and there are polyfills for web components. So there is a polyfill called webcomponents.js, um, and just so you know, webcomponents.org is a good place, a good starting point for a lot of this stuff. You can get to webcomponents.js from there. And it has polyfills for all of these specs created by the Polymer group at Google and also the Mozilla group as well, okay? And uh, Web Components Lite excludes the Shadow DOM, okay? And the general consensus is that although there is a working Shadow DOM polyfill um, and it's built into Chrome, um, if you want real cross-browser support um, and you want it to be performant, uh, generally the consensus is to use the Lite version. Uh, the Shadow DOM polyfill is really heavyweight because it has to wrap all of the elements on the page, okay? <laughs> So this is what web, webcomponents.js actually supports. So it actually supports IE10. Um, the little uh, squeaky mark means that the support may be flaky in some cases for custom elements and HTML import. Um, I'm not really sure how flaky. Uh, I know Google is actually shipping stuff using Polymer, so maybe, you know, I think they are expecting people might be hitting it with IE10. Uh, so it would just be something to look into if you were targeting IE10 and just make sure that the stuff that you need to do is actually fully supported. There is another project called XTag from Mozilla, which builds on top of the Web Components JS uh, polyfills and adds support for IE9. Uh, so if you need support IE9, you should definitely check out XTag. Okay, so let's say you're sold, hopefully, or at least interested, or else you wouldn't be here. So how do you actually write a, write a Web Component? Okay, um, and there's, there's, there's at least three different ways. One way is you use JavaScript, right? Uh, there are specs, they're in the web platform, you use the polyfills, you can just write JavaScript in HTML and just use it, right? But, you know, like most things, there, is, there are ways to do it that are theoretically a little bit simpler. So, you can use XTag. Uh, which is Mozilla's library that has those polyfills, but also has some other things as well. Or you can use Polymer. Okay. So those are basically your three options. So let's talk about each, each one of these in a little bit more detail. Oh, I, I should mention that uh, there are, there's a UMN, UMN generator, starter project, etc. at Web Components on GitHub. So if you're interested in, in you know, any one of these techniques, there's a handy little Generator you can use, there's also starter projects there as well. So the first one would be vanilla JS, right? So just plain old JavaScript. So here's here's a simple counter, right? Very straightforward, it counts, you know, it has an element called simple counter. If we uh, look at the HTML, uh, if you look in the head here, we are including web components min, we're including our simple counter JS file. And then just by doing that, uh, we're able to have a little simple counter element. And this one just updates this inner text with a counter value. All right, very straightforward. Okay. So in order to write this, what you would do 
is find the right project here. Right, there we go. All right, so that's that same page we saw. And here's an example of the, uh, here's the actual file itself. Okay. So this is, could you guys read that in the back? Let me make this a little bigger. All right. Is that good? Okay. All right, so, uh, you know, of course, we need to uh, give it its own block so we don't pollute the global namespace. Um, but, you know, like we saw earlier, you create your, your new prototype. And um, then you can just add properties and methods to it. Um, there are a few standard callbacks. There's a created callback, which gets called when um, your element is created. There is an attached callback to get, that gets called when your element is added to the DOM. There is a detached callback to be called when the element is removed from the DOM. And there's also an attribute change callback as well. Um, which tells you if someone, the attribute uh, on your element has been changed in any way, okay? And uh, one of the things to point out, though, is that you have, if you have properties, it's not the same as attributes on your element. Your element has, you know, a, 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 a collection of property, of, of attributes, right? They can call by calling get attribute, right? But if you want to actually map that to a property with a getter and a setter, et cetera, on your, on your, on your element, you've got to do a little bit of work. So here, there is a count that I'm using internally, and I'm just basically grabbing that from the start attribute, okay, initially, right? And that's that's what's handy about having the attribute change callback as well, is that you can do stuff like say, okay, well, if this attribute has this value, then I want to do something, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So it's a very simple API, right? Um, and then, um, you know, you can have whatever methods you want. These are the start and stop methods that just start and stop the counter. Um, and then there's an update method, which is called to actually update the inner HTML, okay? And then down here, we have the uh, actual registering, registration of the element itself, okay? So this is a pure JavaScript version that doesn't use HTML templates, okay? Um, if you wanted to see what a version with HTML templates look like, it would look uh, sort of like this. Uh, this one. Okay. So in this example, go back here. So this is the actual file that uses this. This is a different counter. Okay. So instead of having um, the uh, the include of the JS file, we're actually including an HTML file here using HTML imports. So we're using we we uh, need to add the uh, web components polyfill first. Then we just use an HTML import link rel equals import to grab the actual deluxe counter HTML file, okay? Inside of that file, we have, um, this actually includes a simple counter because it actually subclasses it or, you know, builds on top of it. Um, here's our template. And our template can have styles, you know, we also have a, a div, right? And then here's the component itself, okay? Um, and this just subclasses a simple counter, but it's the same basic idea, okay? So typically, this is how you would do things. You would probably put it all in the .html file, uh, put your template at the top, and then uh, have your Java code below it, and then include whatever other additional JavaScript resources um, or other resources you need as well, okay? So that is a, a very uh, straightforward or simple example of a custom element. Any questions? Yeah. No. Um, but the web components that JS Polyfill is, is good at um, uh, degrading, so it's not going to run stuff if in Chrome. But if you use it in another browser, it'll degrade on the features that aren't supported. Um, or that, and, and also. One important thing to note, though, is that uh, I think even on the Firefox, I think it still uses the the polyfills because they don't the versions in Firefox don't quite play nicely with the polyfills. Um, but that's the story. All right. 
So there's also XTAG, which is a small library uh, from Mozilla for creating web components. Okay, so it has those polyfills for IE9, but also has some syntactic sugar for making it easier to build the web components. Um, doesn't use a Shadow DOM polyfill. And it has a few basic components, like an accordion, flipbox, modal, slide panel, et cetera. It's actually used in Firefox OS. Um, how many people have actually seen Firefox OS? Anybody? A few of you. All right, cool. Yeah, I haven't actually seen it yet. Um, but basically, it's one of the key building blocks for Firefox OS. So um, there's actually a, a GitHub repository. I forgot what it's called, but it has dozens of web components to building for Firefox OS. Um, and some of them are documented in the developer documentation. Okay. Um, Microsoft is actually now using it for some custom elements or web components as well. Okay. Um, and just, there's no, been no official announcement. There is just one developer that tweeted that he was doing it for Microsoft. <laughs> so, you know, uh, take that with a grain of salt. And this is what things look like in XTAC. So, So here, it's you know, a little bit nicer to use. You can call xtag.register, um, the name of the element. Um, you can say if it extends something, uh, then it has just shorter versions of the same lifestyle, lifestyle uh, functions, callbacks. Um, you can specify events. You can use accessors, which are just properties. Um, and then you can throw in your methods. Okay. So it's a much more concise version of, of, of you know, what you saw with the pure JavaScript version. Okay. Also, there are some additional features in there, so a few utility methods, things like that. So it's, to me, it's a really good example of a lightweight way to make developing the components a little bit simpler. Okay. And then, of course, there's Polymer. How many people have heard of Polymer before uh, this conference? Okay. All right, it's a testament to Google, I must say. So the, Polymer is, first and foremost, a library for building web components. Okay? And they make the distinction library. It's not a framework. It's not, it's not Angular. It's not uh, React. It's not Backbone. It is a library for building web components, first and foremost. It has a really extensive feature set. Number one is a, very, is a simplified programming model, so uh, just like X tags. Um, it makes it easier to write web components. It has two-way data binding, a uh, declarative event model, has behaviors or mix-ins, has property observation. Uh, all these things you really need when you really start building out components, these sort of features you actually really need. Okay. So all that's in there. Um, there's also an extensive set of web components as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So on top of the library, there are a whole bunch of uh, web components that Google is building as well. And there's also a ton of tools. I, uh, I can't keep track of them all. Uh, so the Polymer team is very productive. They've got uh, a web component tester tool. They have um, build tools. They have, they're working on a designer. Um, they've got a, a poly lint for doing lint checking, all sorts of crazy stuff. So a lot of tools to make your life easier as a developer. Uh, so the number one thing about Polymer is that it's developed by and used by Google internally. Okay, uh, and uh, because of this, it's very well funded. Um, the reason you guys know about it is because Google has done a very good job at uh, making you all aware, right? And Google claims that there's over 300 different projects at Google using web components. Okay, um, now I don't know how big these projects are, I don't know how many of them are public facing, etc. But a notable example is a new site called gaming.youtube.com. So if you go to gaming.youtube.com, um, oh, yeah. you'll see if my internet connection works, this site. Um, how many people have been here before? Gaming.youtube.com, so a couple of you. I had never heard of it actually before. Um, I guess I'm not a big gamer, so. Uh, but, um, you know, it's pretty flashy. It's got a whole bunch of icons, you know. I can add stuff to my games. I can go and, uh, you know, poke around and look at stuff. I haven't played with it enough to fully understand what goes on here, but it looks very cool. Um, and, but the important thing is that that is an actual public site, right? This is 
it's a YouTube site. Now, obviously, sorry, my presentation just started over. Um, obviously, it's not YouTube.com, um, but it is an actual public website that's going to get a lot more views than an internal application. All right, let me go back to where I was. Okay, it's also starting to be used by internally for parts of Chrome. So some of the some of the um, sort of settings pages are starting to use web components. Um, Google claims there's over 150,000 public-facing web pages. I'm not sure exactly what a web page means. I don't know if that means you go to one site and they have 20 pages. If that counts as 20 pages of those 150,000 or what? But that's what they say. And of course, it's heavily promoted by Google. Um, if you're interested in Polymer, uh, there is there was a, an actual summit in Amsterdam this year called Polymer Summit. All of the presentations are online. They're very good. Um, there's also a, uh, a, a, a YouTube channel um, that has what they're called Polycasts, which are presentations um, by Rod Dotson, who is a developer advocate for Polymer. Um, and they're really good and useful to go over specific areas of Polymer. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. All right, so let's take a look at Polymer real quick. Um, so this is uh, a very interesting thing. So, so one of the great things about Polymer is they've done so much tooling and framework stuff around it that if you write your own web component, you can very easily get a page like this. You see my documentation, properties, methods. If there's behaviors or something, there would be here. Um, and then I can go to the demo. I get my demo. This is a deluxe counter, that same sort of component, um, you know, with some different properties being set, etc. I go back to the docs, and all this is done by getting. Um, there's one GitHub project called Seed Element. I got that. Add stuff to it, and essentially, what um, what's in in Seed Element, uh, or what's giving you that that pretty document page, is something called. Iron component page. It's a web component, right? So all I, all I had to do is I wrote the web component, um, the index page. Uh, you know, it includes the the uh, the light version of the polyfill. It includes this other web component called iron component page. Just that one component, and I threw it in my folder, and I uh, specified the source of the uh, component I wanted to work with, and Magically, voila, I get that really cool page, right? Now there are some assumptions that as soon as a demo is in demo slash is in a demo folder, it's hard to see, but it assumes it's in a demo folder. It assumes that you have a Bower file with, with the name of the component, things like that. Um, but it's not a lot that you have to do, right? And then you get all that for free, the documentation. Um, so the actual component looks like this, all right? So in Polymer, when you specify the template part, you put it in a DOM module, okay, with an ID. Um, this is my uh, CSS in here. This is my actual component part. You see, I've got a div, and um, let's see if I can close that, collapse that here. So I've got a div and two divs, right? And there are these things, which is the data binding feature. So this is basically going to look for a property uh, on my on my element called main class. It's going to look for a property called value. Okay. Um, and in here, I'm injecting or projecting uh, content that's inside of my element. Okay. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much what's going on here. There's also an event handler here. So if someone clicks on the div inside my element, I get an event handler. Okay. And then the code looks like this. Okay. So you say what component it is. And then, of course, you specify your properties. It gives you a nice syntax for doing properties. You can do simple ones. You can do more complicated ones. And you know, all of these features are documented very well. Um, but you know, I've got, I've got a type that can specify an initial value. Um, I can specify notification, which gives me, gives me the two-way property binding. So if I have child elements, the value will pop, propagate down, and if there are changes from the child elements, they'll propagate up. Um, obviously, that's opt-in for performance reasons. Um, I can have uh, observers for events. So anytime the value of this, anytime my value property changes, 
I can get uh, this this event handler call even if I don't have notified set to true. Okay. And then I can just specify my functions. Um, there is a ready function, attached, detached, etc. Um, ready is a little bit different. It's actually since Polymer has to do some additional processing, um, you generally use ready because that'll be called after Polymer is done with the, its initial processing. Okay. Um, and then attach is called. And so I put my event handlers in here. Um, and then, of course, I can have whatever, prop, whatever other functions that I need or whatever other methods which are provide the public API for my element. Right? Then I can specify any other event handlers, etc. Okay? So it gives you a very nice sort of um, API for working with web components. Okay? And to use this, um, it's just like any other uh, element. You see I've got, uh, I do an import of my deluxe counter. Okay. This is the demo page. I have my own styles here. And then I have different examples of the, de of the, uh, the component using different attributes which are part of the public API. Right? And here I can programmatically add an event listener for a custom event called count uh, for my component. So Polymer lets you do custom events as well. Okay. So that, that's sort of a very quick overview of what a Polymer element looks like. I'm almost out of time, so let me uh, go through the rest of these. And again, you got my get your lovely page here. All right, so web components in the wild. So this sounds cool, but what other actual web components you can work with off the shelf? So remember, there's two things, right? There's the ability to actually write a web component, right? Which is mostly what I've been talking about, but you can also use them, right? So if you want to use a web component in your project, regardless of whether or not what framework you're using, uh, the question is, what uh, can you, what, what components can you use? So um, first of all, there is the Polymer element catalog. So all the different elements which are built on top of Polymer from Google. And all this stuff is open source. There is Basonic, which is a, another third party uh, open source uh, collection of components which are really more sort of general purpose components, but very handy and it's written using vanilla JavaScript, doesn't use XTag, doesn't use Polymer. So a good sort of neutral choice. There's the Firefox OS, uh, I don't know how that, that's really supposed to be pronounced, G-A-I-A -A components. Um, but there's, that's their, uh, the name for their components they're using in Firefox OS. These aren't really, I don't think they're necessarily designed for public consumption, but it's a good place to look to see what stuff is like. Um, there's also a project for developing uh, custom, uh, using custom elements to write standard HTML components. And it's really more of a sort of investigative project from, uh, from the Chrome team. And there's also a couple of directories. There's customelements.io, component.kitchen, which are good places to just find lots and lots of random uh, different web components that different people have written. Uh, usually they're on GitHub. Okay. So Polymer has a whole bunch of different elements. It's by far the largest collection. Um, I encourage you, I don't have time for a demo, but I encourage you to take a look if you in Polymer, or even if you just want elements and you use your application, there are uh, lots of uh, Google Web components, things like working with different Google APIs, whether it's Firebase, whether it's Maps, etc. Um, paper elements, you use the material design language, so they give you lots of really nice responsive UI components built on top of uh, using the, the uh, material design um, language, or, you know, language is, is the term they use, but, you know, uh, that whole look and feel. And actually, Polymer was the, the, is the web-based web reference for material design, as a matter of fact. Um, there's also the iron elements, which are the core Polymer elements, which have some sort of basic things like that um, component is used for documentation, like I just showed you, um, some form handling component as an AJAX component. That's an important thing to remember, is that I've been talking mostly about uh, UI components, right? But custom components and web components don't have to be UI components. There are components in Polymer in these element uh, sets for Ajax, for, um, in, I think it's the Platinum elements, there's stuff for service worker, um, offline stuff. Um, there's uh, elements for Firebase, like I mentioned before. Um, so everything doesn't have to be visual. It's really more about encapsulating functionality behind a simple declarative API, and also a JavaScript API as well. 
So if you want to see more of those, I encourage you to check them out. They're, they're very, very powerful and very attractive. Okay, we talked a little bit about Bisonic. Um, not much more to say about that. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at those sites, customelements.io, etc. All right, so what about your current framework of choice? Uh, Angular is from Google as well, right? And they have pledged, uh, you know, integration and interoperability in Angular JS2 with web components. Um, and I'm pretty confident that's going to be the case. Um, I don't really have a good story for how to use them in Angular 1. Um, I imagine, I think what I've heard is that it's possible, but not, not as easy as it's supposed to be, as you might expect it to be. Okay. Um, Ember, React have both talked about, have both publicly said they're going to support and integrate with web components. I heard there's been some people on the React team that aren't too into web components, but I think the overall goal is to, to provide interoperability. Um, and uh, some of these server-side Java frameworks are going to support it in some way as well. And Vaadin actually, have people heard of Vaadin before? Anybody? It's, it's more popular than Java space, but they're starting to do some web components now. They even have a, a, a data grid available uh, for free. So. so that's the story there. Um, so the final thoughts are that um, web visual and non-visual components um, and reuse and encapsulation are sort of the key things with web components. And the other key, of course, is that it's built into the web platform. Okay. So the idea is that you'll be able to use these across different frameworks, um, you know, and, and in some cases just pull in different components for the features you need. And I firmly believe, as do many others, that this is the future of the web. Um, we've kind of gone way beyond just having primitive uh, divs and, you know, primitive input elements as the language for uh, an application, right? So this allows us to actually have the language that we're using to build the application be reflective of what actually is going on, right? So whether it's a data table or an AJAX component or something else, there's a way to describe your page, your application, that actually makes sense um, at the actual uh, platform level. Okay. And of course, there's some caveats. There are lines on polyfills, although the polyfills have been really tuned to make them very performant. As long as you exclude Shadow DOM, you're pretty much guaranteed to have decent performance, um, which is important. And of course, modern browsers only, although with X tags, you can get all the way back to IE9. Okay. All right, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much for coming. It's officially lunchtime, so if you have any questions, just come up at the end.